Hey, I swung my mattock on a fracking rig and slavish sweated, saving up my pay. My cell phone buzzed. I dropped my pick to pick it up. My wife, with labor in her voice, began to shout, The baby's on the way! I found my boss and said, I'm gonna go. What hell you are, he puffed. I need you here. A crowd of roughnecks gathered around to watch him swell and pop. There's drilling to be done. There's riches to be blasting out the dirt. You keep your dirt, I said, and shoulder pats. And keep your natural gas. My wife just called. My baby's coming fast. I'm gonna see that child born. He blustered, but them roughnecks cheered. I bounded to my GMC, a diesel 93, and started her in third. In Bismarck, across the, in the mountains, lay my wife, a windy 190 miles away, when five and twenty miles and felt my tires tread in fifteen minutes, maybe less. My dash began to beep and whistle, quick and shrill, to warn me I was nearly out of gas. I glimpsed a hovel half abandoned with a pump. I braked and barreled in and told the gas boy, fill her up, then found I'd left my wallet down beneath my bunk from bed. I told the kid, he spat and drawled, no cash, no gas. Now hit the road. Now, listen, please, I begged. I got a baby being born in Bismarck, man. I gotta get that gas. He frowned. You know, the Bismarck Road is closed. You can't get through a blizzard's block the pass. You drive that road, you're gonna die. But shit, he smiled. I guess you're gonna need some gas to try. Ahead, across a barren plain, a range of sheer and sudden snow-cased mountains loomed there, upper slopes enshrouded by a mist both gray and grim and menacing to see. With flashing lights across my path, a lower gate on sentry stood and bore a while a sign that warned, Turn back! It's suicide to try! I stopped to chain my tires up and drove on by, up gorges carved by wind-borne daggers, cold and sharp. Above a jagged precipice that dropped into a frozen stream a mile below, I steered two-handed, knuckles white, my tires slipping, losing traction on the ice. I shifted low and locked the hubs until, now blinded by a swirling fog, I cranked her down the floor and crawled up slope. Three times I dropped a tire off the edge, and twice retreated down a grade too steep to curse and grab a running start and floor a rear and swerving through the drift. I topped the peak and skidded slowly down the backside to the mountain's far off base. I rolled the brakes and smelled them burn and watched with dread each minute fearing I'd be late. I twisted down that turning way until I hit the winter brown Dakota Plains beyond the storm's domain, then dropped my chains and laughing, punched that pedal through the floor. Just when before me up rose Bismarck Town, a slender spired city beckoning to me like he'd had never lost. Behind me in my mirror pulsed a trooper's lights for speeding recklessly and licenseless. He tried arresting me, and though I told him I was going to see my child born, he wouldn't quit. I doored him and escaped, careening closer to my soon-born child. I counted closing on a dozen cops behind me, sirens blaring, but I dodged their roadblocks. Then I hit the city streets. I blasted through the traffic lights and squealed around the corners, two-wheeled, leaning on my horn and on the sidewalk, passing cars with swarms of sirens swirling close behind. I ditched my tux truck, still running, cyclone through the spinning doors to find a tender death where, calmly as I could, I said my name and asked, My wife, what number room is she? Policeman, like a pack of savage apes, burst hooting, hollering onto the scene. I split, they followed, knocking over beds, and sleeping patients hooked to fluid bags. I slammed my shoulder through a door. She smiled, she gasped, she screamed, and sighed. And as they cuffed me on the floor, I heard some from a pair of once used lungs, a warm and tiny wail. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. I feel set. A peace story. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm You're glad right. I could finally. Glad to have you, bud. Yeah, this is awesome. This <laughs> is awesome. So uh, that one was not a true story, but this next one. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this next one's a little weird, but you know it happened a couple years ago or whatever, so you know, no big deal. I call it inside the belly of the slug. Uh, I curse the day our failing spaceship crashed on such a savage, swampish, plantless world as this. This land of flies and slugs, I curse this tomb wherein I'll and sepulchre rot. After three years marooned, I warmed my sleep. I flushed my prison with a pillow girl by night. I stole a native bride whose brute and all his tribe of hut men wailed her loss. My captain, pleasure planet, Lord Lang, damn his eyes that morning! 
found my girl, bare breast, his lust of fawning puppet made of him, he, feigning righteous anger, said to me, I ordered you to leave the natives be, to plunder not their daughters or their wives, so if enslaved she'll be, she'll be enslaved to me, to punish you she'll be my bride. I let her go at his command to serve his meals and share his bed, to dissipate the captain meant a weary, labored life of breaking rocks on airless prison worlds, but then I thought authority had for three years forgot our stranded squad. We crashed outside the shadow of his brutal might. I thought the mighty here can take what's theirs. The dusk had deepened into night, and all my brother soldiers, space marines, if not on guard, lay still asleep. When in his hut I told the captain he could yield the girl or die. To hell with you, he cried, and in a rage came toppling from his cot to prove that he still ruled, but I had brought my blade and spilled his guts onto the dirty floor. He died. My gutless captain twitched and stilled. I grabbed my bride and dragged her from the hut. Outside, my brother soldiers, wakened by his uh, cries, had circled round the square with cudgels drawn. The captain's dead! And I'm the captain now, I said, and any man who wants can take a bride. They glared and bared their teeth, and one man cried, Let's take this traitor's head. We fled into a rocky, swampish way so awful, even the space marines who'd borne beside me blood and war, abandoned chase, and left us to the horrors of the land. The cavern, close and cramping, kept us from the shrieking wind. She begged me. Well, and take me back again to whence I came. I said, because of you, I'm almost dead. You're mine. So late that night, she seized her chance to take no more from me. And as I slept, she cracked my head against a stone and left me trussed up on the dirt alone and went back home. Her brutish man and all his hulking tribe. These hutmen who had sounded sorrow from the far-off walls that rim this plantless, tortured, slug-filled valley came out hunting then. They traced their path and wearing skins from slugs, the massive ones on which they made their feasts, they found my cave and on fat heaps of blood or burned my legs on arriving, screamed, but even torture ends. And when they'd had their fun, they chose the slug in which to hide my breathing, thinking half-dead flesh. A slug was found. They put me down. I am inside. Then... Rage! I'd not be suffocated slow to agonizing, feel the creature's juice into my sugars break me down! I fought with frenzied limbs to tear a hole. I failed. I cried and cursed my bride, my captain too, but hours passed inside the slug, then days... And as I brooded in my agony, I realized all the evil done was mine. I stole the girl. I spilled my captain's guts. And if I ever heard the story of my deeds, I'd sneer and spit and wish upon myself a monstrous fate to fit my monstrous act. So now I curse myself. I know I've earned my sleep, digesting slowly in a slug, just as I know I'm doomed to linger, phantomed in the hatred that is all that's thought of me. Boy. <laughs> That's a true story? Yeah. <laughs> I learned my lesson, though. Uh, this one's a little more on the normal side. <laughs> <laughs> I never got around to memorizing it, so sorry about this. Uh, my daughter's ripening, unwanted, in my girlfriend's belly, so we wonder, should we plague ourselves with cares beyond our years? Or murder who would else wants to be our child? She doesn't want to be a mother yet. She dreams of doing, she had undone. She wants to turn into remembrance, but she fears with mother's manacles they'll never be. How selfish, rude, and shallow can she be to whine of dreams undone and so deny our child the chance of wondrous childhood and all the unfriendly doings of its life? But it's not just of me to slander her. It's not my body that a baby grows inside, just as I'm not the baby that inside her body grows. So who am I? I'm just the guy that has to find a job in Philly where she lives so I can be a daddy. Just the guy who's got to give up all I've got to give them all they need. But would it even be a sacrifice to watch a little girl of mine go big? To read The Hobbit to my daughter and to know I'm good enough to be a dad? Just yesterday, I counted out in dimes the price of toothpaste, and for lunch I ate unbuttered toast. 
Can I be sure I feed a child when I can't even feed myself? My girlfriend knows, and I know too, that we would love our baby, smile with pleasure as she dreams. We'd watch her play and grow with pride. We'll cry when she has daughters of her own, but we're afraid that daughter shouldn't be this daughter, that this one's come too early, and we just can't give a baby what we need, that this daughter would be best but she's alive already, no one born, deserving not of darkest chemicals, but love of life, not poison. So between us both, we don't know what to do. Would you? Thanks. <laughs> All right, I got one more. Play this one down on you. Uh, down in a time-lost jungle, long ago forgot, where ferns and fragrant orchids grow, the westering sun a parting smile throws upon a homely group of hand-built bungalows, where lived a venerated tribe of wisdom crones and elders bearded gray, where men and women toiled through the day, and children scampered through the jungle in their play, and at its terrors jibed. When on the stones the daily meal was done, before by darkness they were overrun, a mother's family count was down by one. She tossed her eyes around the home to find her son, then put his dinner on the floor. And as she watched his yams and beets grow cold, she dreamed up firm and cunning ways to scold that kid of hers, who never did what he was told and always shirked his chores. So, thinking in some kiddish trickery he was engaged, she tripped around to see if he could eating with his cousins be, whose endless lawless days were idled, running free and wild with other children of their age. She found the cousins munching mangoes, yams, and beetles happily. Did buy a ram, they said, and smiled, then said they'd seen her wayward lamb out by the monkey cage. The monkeys hopped and goofed and grins. Alone, the mother frowned and left. Returning home, she heard the dusky insects Dr. Drone beneath the trees, and feared the lingering rays that shone still from the swift departing sun. And when she found that still he wasn't there, she started tugging at her well-kept hair, and when her husband wondered why she wildly glared, she said, I've lost our son. His darkness tightly wrapped its shrouding pall. Outside, the parents both began to call their child's name. From out their dwellings, all their tribesmen came to wonder at this startling squall, this sudden storm of fearful cries, but company did nothing to relieve the mother's fears. Instead, she was bereaved by numbering the hours since last her child had breathed before her tribesmen's eyes, and as she fretted, clenched her teeth, and paced the village queen, who wore upon her face a look of weight and worry, placed herself where all the tribe could see her reaper grace, and said, We'll find this missing boy. A bursting clamor rang out from the town as throbbing drums were beat and torches bound and round their hearts an icy, evil serpent wound of terror for the boy. Into the empty dark and search they spilled and with their hopeful, fearful calling filled the night above the strongest of them shrilled the mother's crying in a jangled key that Chilled the spines of all who heard those screams. Had he become the coiling python's prey? Had he by apes been spirited away? Was he now rotting down by where the water lizards lay? The worst the mother dreamed. They stumbled through the jungle black and groped their way past clinging creepers, spilled down slopes and swallowed up their feet and blind and loped and slowed and plodded. Out of them drained their hope. And as the moon began to sink, they plodded still and called, but Rarely now, and shouldered through the jungle's drooping boughs that barred their way and rubbed their hands across their brows while heavy eyelids blinked as weary, frightful miles fruitless passed beneath the searcher's feet and do the grass began to dampen all their eyes were glass and o'er blades with lack of sleep. The queen at last had cried that they would search no more. The mother's haggard face blanched deathly pale, and from her trembling chest there tore a wail, a howling, anguish, spectral, dreadful, endless wail. She begged them to search some more, but though she wildly shrieked and pleading, groaned and grabbed her, flailing, brought her to her home, and left her guarded as she cried and moaned and dreamed of jungle ghosts and whitely gleaming bones and droned and droned. My boy is lost. Until the graying of the morning came, she sat awake and whimpered out his name while torturing herself with unjust blame. She drove, My boy is lost. Mad, 
morn, and he gathered round the queen again with stony hearts. The women and the men prepared themselves to comb again the glens and dells, and even searched the skulking panther's den to find the body of the boy. Listlessly, without a hope, they walked, until one heard a scuffle down below a rock, and found the living boy. From out her bursting joyful bosom swelled a shout of jungle death undone. A yell whose timbre did the grieving mother tell. Her only child still in daylight's world dwelled. The boy was found. The boy was found. She bolted to the spot and pressed him close while blissful sobs ripped out his chest. He cried and nuzzled hard against her heaving breast. Her boy. Her boy was found. The tribe began to chant and cheer. They sang an ode of love and happiness, then ran right across the world. They up to heaven, flag a pair of song that angels sing, and bring the boy back to the waiting town. All the day they beat their drums in celebration, and all the night they danced in jubilation at the termination of the separation. The boy! The boy was found! Wow, nice guys. <laughs> oh.